book of John, St. John chapter 6. This is one of my favorite readings, and I've preached from this on numerous occasions. Uh, but there are some things that, as usual, there are some things that were given me, and I thank you for being here today. Uh, there's actually fewer of us, quite a few fewer of us. I know vacations and people moving their kids into college and uh, a lot of people traveling to get their last-minute vacations. But you know what? Jesus is here and you're here. And uh, right now, that's all that matters. And so I'm thankful that you're here, thankful for those of you who invited guests and brought guests with you today. Uh, this, is a, this is a very special message to me, and I'm, I've received something that I hope will be a blessing to you this week. John chapter 6, verse 1, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And the great multitude followed with him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. In the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. And uh, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company uh, come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall you buy bread that these may eat? And uh, this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. In other words, Philip's like, How are we going to pay for this? We don't have enough money, Jesus. We don't have enough. Say with me, we don't have enough. We, don't have enough. we can't pay for all these people to eat. And if, even if we did, if we spent everything we had, they would just have a little bit. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's brother, said unto him, There's a lad here which has five lar barley loaves and two f small fishes. But what are they among so many? We've got, a, we've got this kid's lunch, but... What is it? I mean, what does it compare to all these people? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. So the men sat down in the number about 5,000. And this is recorded in all the Gospels. And in one of the Gospels, it talks about only the men were 5,000. Just the men. And there were women and children as well. So you've got to think about that this was a multitude of people. And, and uh, there were probably as many women and children, if not more so, than there were men. They just counted the men. So you're probably talking 10, 12,000. All right, so you have a multitude of people here, and you got a couple of fish and some loaves, some little, these are, these are like what you get at, uh, uh, um, what would it be, the Olive Garden. Okay, these aren't big loaves of bread. These are, these are the little loaves, probably little fishes and little loaves. Because the Sea of Galilee is not actually part of the ocean, it's a lake. It's a freshwater lake, so you're probably not talking about giant fish either. All right, now, where am I? Somebody please tell me. Okay. Verse 11. All right. And Jesus took the loaves, and we had, when he had given thanks, in another one of the Gospels it says, whenever he had blessed them and broke, broken them, he multiplied them. And he distributed to the disciples. You may be seated. He took these loaves and these fishes and he distributed them to the disciples. Now that is, of course, you've all read this many, many times, been taught this in Sunday school. If you were in Sunday school as a young person, um, you know the story. So this is no great revelation to you, but let me hold on for a moment. It's about to become a revelation to you. And the disciples, to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as many as they would. When they were whenever they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Okay, so Jesus took the loaves, he blessed them, broke them, he multiplied them, the loaves and the fishes, and he distributed it to the disciples. And the disciples, to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, they said unto the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. 
Therefore, they gathered to themselves together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Now, don't you know, I mean, you had these 12 disciples, these, these 12 men, okay? And, of course, I'm sure that these guys were hungry, too. You had uh, thousands and thousands of people out here, and you had one kid's lunch. And, um, you know, don't you know, you had, you had men like Judas Iscariot out here, okay? The, the penny pincher, Judas, was a part of the twelve. All right, you had, uh, you had, uh, along with, and, and, and Philip had already said, how, how is this going to work? You know, Andrew, we just don't have enough. All we got is this little basket full of food. How is this going to work? And of course, you had unstated in the scripture, Sister Crystal, you had Thomas, who Thomas is, you know, you know what Thomas is known for. That's why he's my favorite disciple. He's known for kind of kind of a, a scientific-minded Dr. Mitchell guy, you know. I, I just just uh, I'm not going to believe in any results until I see those results. How many of you are like that? I, I am. I was born with that type of mind that you know what I will believe it whenever I see it. And Thomas actually said that after Jesus had, had been crucified and rose from the dead and everybody else had seen him. But Thomas, he said, fellas, I don't care what you say. And I know what Jesus said before he was crucified. He said he was going to rise on the third day. Thomas heard that, but he said, I won't believe it until I see it. So don't you know, Thomas was out there going, well, I wonder when Jesus is going to run out of food. I'm hungry. You know, and here's all these thousands of people, and Jesus is just up here, blessing, breaking, multiplying, and handing it out to the disciples. They go feed those, and he, he separated them out to uh, groups of 10 and 100 so that they'd make sure and get everybody fed. So here's a basket, here's a basket, here's a basket, here's a basket. Here. You know, and, and I've heard that these baskets, I've heard it preached that these baskets were uh, huge baskets that they were used to carry people around in. I don't know. I, I can't prove that. I tried to prove it, but I can't prove that. But I know he was handing out the baskets to the people to go feed these multitudes of people. And, you know, the disciples, they kind of had a decision to make. When Jesus handed them a basket of food, they had this basket of food. And, you know, I don't know when Jesus is going to run out of food, but I know all he has is one little basket. He gave me this basket of food. I don't know how he got this basket of food that he gave me, but I, I know I've got this basket of food and I'm supposed to deliver it, but I've got a choice to make because I'm hungry too. Should I just eat this food myself? Should I just have a snack or should I go and feed the people? Should I? Because I know that Jesus does not have enough food. I know that Jesus does not have enough food and I, I believe that at any time he's going to run out and there will not be enough for me. If they had done that, I don't know what Jesus would have done, but it, could it be that the multitude would have gone away hungry? And that the crowd, that this miracle would have never been recorded. And that the crowd would have went away unbelieving. But the crowd, let me tell you something, went away believing because there was a miracle in their presence. They saw a couple of fish and a few loaves turned into enough to feed the multitude right before their eyes. But it was because ultimately of the decision, the miracle was there. But it was the decisions, I will, I will tell you, it was the decision of each disciple that, you know what, I am going to be obedient because I believe in what Jesus is doing. I, I don't know how Jesus is doing this, but I know that he can. You say, well, 
You know, how did they know that he could? I, you know, I, I, I would have been thinking, when's Jesus going to run out of food? Right. I think I would have. You know, it's no mystery, and I, I want to I wanna make a quick point here. This is not the point of my message, but I want to make a, a, a quick point. Write this one down. I don't know how big the baskets were. I don't know if they were bushel baskets. I know they were big enough for lunch. I know they were they probably pretty good sized baskets because it, they had a lot of people to feed. If they were handing out little baskets, you'd have to have a lot of baskets. But to me, it's not a mystery why there were 12 baskets left over. After they had fed everybody that there were 12 baskets left over. I want to say something to you as servants of God, especially those of you who preach and who teach, those of you who witness, your servants of God. Sometimes it may seem like Jesus doesn't have enough. Sometimes it seems like there's not enough for you. Sometimes it seems like things are going to run out before it gets to you. But his name is called Faithful. And let me tell you something, Jesus never runs out of anything. Amen? Can you, can you say that with me? Jesus never runs out of anything. That he is enough for me. He is my portion. And I know that if I just continue to serve, if I continue to do his will, that at the end of it all, there's a basket with my name on it. There will be provision made for me. There will be provision made for you. Don't you worry because Jesus has got enough. At the end of the day, he's got a basket just for you. And it's going to be enough. Is it going to be so much that you can't eat it? He said he didn't want to waste any of it. So I don't think it was so much they couldn't eat it all. Because he said, don't waste, a, don't waste a bit of it. I, I don't personally believe in, uh, you know, I, I do believe that God blesses his people. He wants to bless his people. But all of this uh, prosperity stuff, you know, I see too many of God's servants going through some hardships to believe what they say on TV. You know, I just do. I, I, I personally, but I will tell you, and I believe this with every fiber of my being, that you just continue serving. When it seems like there's not enough, at the end of the day, there will be enough for you. God will sustain you. He will provide for you. It's not up to you. Don't believe in what you, what you saw. Believe in the God that is breaking it for you. Believe in the God that is blessing it for you. And believe in the God that is already multiplying it unto you. He is enough. And that is not my message point today, but I wanted to stop there and say that if it seems like, and I know that a lot of people, especially right now, are going through financial hardship. Many, many, many people, and we have really, really, the church has worked together as we are supposed to, to feed a lot of people, to help a lot of people in these difficult times. These are difficult times. And, um, but I want you to know, you don't worry about it. You just keep serving. You keep serving and God will take care of it. That's not what I came here to say. So, but the, uh, these men though, there were 12 of them, even Judas, even Thomas, they, you know, they just kept serving. They, they didn't, you know, they, they just kept on serving. They didn't, they didn't. Wonder when is Jesus going to, I, I'm sure they did wonder, but they kept serving anyway. And you say, well, that, that takes a great level of faith. That takes a great level of faith to say, you know what, I'm going to serve others first. But you, you got to say, though, that Jesus handpicked these men because they were supernaturally gifted. No, no. No, you say, well, the disciples, they were just a special, and this is what religion will teach you. Okay, that these apostles, these were holy men. They were unlike any others, and they did things that no one else can do. 
that no one else since them has ever been able to do. Baloney! These are a bunch of fishermen. These are some tax collectors and stuff like that. I mean, they're accountants and there's nothing. The only thing special about these guys is they said yes to Jesus. Amen. And they got to spend time with Jesus. That is the only thing special about them. As a matter of fact, I've often said before, I wonder how many people that Jesus went to and said, hey, you want to follow me? Before he got 12. How many people did he go to? I don't know. But I know that those 12 said yes. But there was nothing special about these men other than they had a relationship with the Lord. Now, so they were not great. They didn't start out as these. No, they became the apostles after they were, after they graduated from being disciples of Christ to apostles. They became great men of faith who worked many miracles in the name of the Lord. Now, you say, well, where did that faith come from then? Where did that great faith come from whenever they were still disciples? Whenever Jesus said, okay, fellas, just feed this multitude with this little bit of food. Where did that come from? Uh, now this is my point. I'm getting to my point. I'm taking you somewhere. I'm going to take you somewhere real good. Just hang on, all right? Buckle your seatbelt. Get your white knuckles ready. We're going somewhere, okay? Can you say amen? Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Okay, so faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You've got to understand where their faith came from. That these 12 guys had been in the presence of Jesus Christ for years. And they had been hearing the word that proceeded out of the mouth of Jesus Christ for at least a couple of years at this point. Every day, all day, the words of God proceeded out of Jesus' mouth. God manifested in flesh was sitting in their presence. And you know what? They didn't even know it most of the time. They did not know who he was until it was revealed to Peter. But they had sat there and they listened to the word of God proceed out of Jesus' mouth. Now, why did Jesus work this miracle? Was it so he could have a miracle recorded? No. There was, he did so many miracles, the volumes would not hold them. He didn't need to work this miracle. If Yes, did he, did he probably boost the faith of these thousands of people that he fed? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that he did. And they were like, my goodness, that was a good lunch. He fed them. They were satisfied. That was a great lunch. Wonderful. And we got to see a miracle today, too. Was he doing it for the congregation? Or was he doing it to teach the disciples. Jesus did not take the food to the people. He gave it to the disciples. Jesus is the bread of life. He went on in, in further chapters and said, I am the bread of life. If you eat of me, you will have everlasting life. I am the bread of life. He hands that bread of life, let me tell you, today. And those apostles, after they became apostles, they worked mighty miracles. They did, but let me tell you something else. Before the day of Pentecost, before they ever received the infilling of the Holy Ghost, those same disciples were preaching the gospel. They were teaching the gospel. They were working miracles in his name. They were casting out demons in his name. They didn't even have the Holy Ghost. They would. They would go out and do all of these things and then come back and give Jesus a report. Say, oh, you won't believe what we did. He was teaching his disciples. 
how to feed the sheep. You see, after Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and ascended, the source of the word of God did not proceed out of his mouth anymore. He said, I've got to go away. I've got to go away. But I'm going to send a comforter to you. I'm going to send someone who will speak through you. I'm going to send someone who will work in you, through you, and for you. And it was out of the mouths of the apostles. It was the works of the apostles. As a matter of fact, that's why they call it the acts of the apostles. It was the works and the acts of the apostles of healing, working miracles, preaching, teaching, uh, healing diseases, casting out demons. But this was happening before they ever got the Holy Ghost. And it was because they believed. You know, they looked, they saw, I believe that all 12 of them saw this kid's lunch. Not just Andrew and Philip, but I believe they all saw this basket of food. Looked like that. And thought, I don't know how he's going to do it. But after they saw after they saw him work many miracles, their faith grew. Their faith grew. Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 1. Now faith, can you say faith? Can you say bink? Okay. Faith is the substance. Say it with me. It's a substance. It is a real substance. This, this contains olive oil. It is a real substance. There is something really in here. Faith is a real substance of things that are hoped for. And it is the evidence of things not seen. Keep going. Next, please. We are having technical difficulties. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Verse 3. Please. By faith, Abel offered... Ooh. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of... Things which do appear. In other words, everything that you see came to be of something that you cannot see. Everything that there is, this desk right here, came to be through a force that you cannot see. All right, But it materialized at one point, and this thing has been in service close to 40 years now. But it materialized from a force that you cannot see. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh. Move on. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him before his translation. He had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith... It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How many of you believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him? And if you diligently seek him, you're going to diligently serve him. And if you diligently serve him, you're diligently going to serve people. Because that's what he called us to do. He said, here's the bread of life. You go feed these people. You know, I, I, uh, 
deal with, and those of you who have been pastors, I don't know how many may have been, may be in the room, but if you've been a pastor, then you will, you will be able to relate to what I'm talking to. I often have people, I talk to people with self-perpetuating problems or problems that seem to be perpetual of poverty of no, no, everybody goes through financial hardship at some time or another, and it's no sign of you being okay. If you're going through a financial hardship, it's no sign of you not having a relationship with God. Let me tell you something. I've, I have, I've been through my share, okay? That is no, so don't think God has, has abandoned you if you're having some financial issues. But if you're having some perpetual, it never seems like you've got two dimes to rub together, you might want to check your relationship with the Lord, because that is not his will for you to just live in perpetual poverty. Okay. If you have perpetual family problems that just seem to get worse and worse and worse, I I deal with these issues all the time that not that for this person, for these people, this set of people, nothing seems to ever work out. They've always got one hand on the trigger. One, an itchy trigger finger in the pistol in their mouth all the time. And it's, it's up to me to try to wrestle that thing out of their mouth. And I'm not, I'm not making fun, don't get me wrong. But, and it's many, many times those same people with perpetual chronic problems and needs that never seem to, no matter how much, no matter how much you do for them, no matter how much you talk to them, that never seems to get any better. And I can tell you the reason why. I, if, if, I can tell you exactly the reason why that that is that it never seems to get any better because that's not God's will for you. That's not God's will for us. It's because that same word of God that proceeded out of the mouth of Jesus, that proceeded out of the mouth of the apostles, proceeds out of the mouth of our teachers and our preachers every Wednesday and every Sunday. But it's those people who have perpetual issues. Their backsides are not in the seats. You've got to understand that what we preach and what we teach, it is not our own words. I pray, I pray, Lord God, that every time that he gives me a message, that it be your words and not mine, that you go beyond me because I cannot do this. That you anoint me, that you speak through me, that it, it is his words that come to us. Can you imagine if you had been invited that day to go listen to Jesus preach? The day that he multiplied and fed the multitudes. And you said, ah, you know, I've really got an opportunity to make some overtime. Yeah, I've got an opportunity to make some overtime. I think I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. You know, and, 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 you know, everybody has vacations. I get that. You need vacations. I get it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people that are chronically absent. They're also chronically problematic for themselves. And and the mystery, I'm solving your mystery today. If you're listening online or if this is you, I'm solving the mystery for you today. The people who, everybody who comes to church has problems, me included. But I will tell you, the people who come and are faithful to the house of God, those problems go away. At the end of the day, the provision is made for you. There is the bread of life that is being delivered to your chair every Wednesday and every Sunday. The question is, are you going to be in that chair? Are you going to be here to receive the bread of life, the word of God that he has prepared through his servants and delivered to your seat? Are you going to be here to get it? First Corinthians chapter one. There's no telling how many times I've talked to people in my office and they're like, man, I've got this problem and it's eating me alive and I don't know what to do about it. And 
I just, you know, it's just eating me up and I, I, I need some advice, Pastor. I, I really need some guidance. And um, um, chapter 1, I'm sorry, verse 18. And, uh, and I, I say, you know what? Were you here Wednesday? Brother Tim just preached on that Wednesday. I mean, that exact thing, the thing that you really needed to learn. I, I, you know, and I'm like, I just preached that. Did you not hear it? And they're like, oh, no, you know, I, I, I had something better to do. Well, you've got problems eating your life, eating your breakfast, you know. And, and well, but what really drives me nuts, and I mean, you know, I'm just letting you get in my head a little bit here. You know, somebody will call me up, cry it, old pastor. <laughs> you know, and uh, I'm like, well, you know, how can I help? And uh, they're like, uh, we know, I just got to see you. I got to meet with you, blah, blah, blah. And they'd say, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm here eight to five. And they're like, well, it'll have to be after 7. I don't get off till 6.30. If it's no more important to you than that, then it's not important. You just want me to say some words to you that will comfort you in your ignorance. I'll tell you how to stay out of my office. Get in these seats. I will tell you how to stay out of perpetual problems. Get in these seats. Get in the seats of your classrooms, of your teachers. They're delivering the bread of life to you. In in small groups, in Sunday school, they studied all week long. They gave up their time, of their energy to feed you. And you didn't show up to eat. I've been doing this for eight years now. That's long enough to earn a doctorate degree. I've got a doctorate in waiting tables. I just deliver the food. So don't shoot the messenger, please. But if you don't show up for what all of these, you know, and the songs speak to you, the words. I don't know the words spoke to me today about what I'm preaching to, to you right now. If you don't show up for the worship service, if you don't show up for the small groups, if you don't show up for Sunday school, if you don't show up for the preaching. I know some people, they like to feel good and worship and then go home. And, you know, you're, you're, you're missing, you're missing church. But if I could counsel with each and every one of you, what I would say to you is that the loaves have been blessed. The fishes have been blessed. They've been broken. They've been multiplied unto you. Jesus said something. Don't waste a bit of it. When you're not here, the bit that was yours is going to waste. The basket that had your name on it is going to waste. And you wonder why you're so hungry. And you wonder why I don't have what I need. You wonder why things never go right for me. It's because you weren't here to receive your portion of what God had prepared for you. Now, Please stand with me. Actually, don't. You're good. Psych. But I, whenever I ask you to be here, I would ask everyone to be here. Be here on Wednesday. Be here on Sunday. Be here for small groups. Be here for our fellowships. Be here or you're going to miss something very important. And it's not for my sake. You know, whenever I look out here and I see every seat full, I love it. 
I love it. Whenever I see people crowding in, whenever I look out here and I see, you know, a lot of spaces in between people, it is a little frustrating. But you know what? Jesus said, just keep serving. It is not, it is not up to you. The results are not up to you. That's something that I've learned over the years. That, you know what? I can't change your situation. I cannot change your relationships. I can't do it. I cannot be responsible for the outcomes. All I can do is grab a basket and start feeding. You are responsible for the outcomes. And if you haven't been here to receive what God has got for you, then the outcomes are not going to be very good. Now, I want to preach something to you real quickly. If you are here to receive, then your faith will grow so that you can receive what you don't see yet. Okay? Because what you have hoped for, you've not been able to see. But if you will hear the words of God, the way the disciples stayed with Jesus when they didn't have a place to lay their head, they stayed with Jesus through the thick and the thin until it got real thin and he got crucified. But they did stay with him for those years. And the things that they hoped for began to materialize before their eyes. That it became it, that substance began to materialize before them. The nature of faith, and not a faith, but the faith, is the same as when Jesus spoke it. It's no different whenever an anointed teacher, an anointed preacher of God, an anointed evangelist, speaks it is no different and and scott already said it today he's like he was talking about when jesus spoke nobody ever spoke like that until jesus spoke but let me tell you since jesus spoke a lot of people are speaking like that amen there are people behind pulpits and in classrooms all over the world speaking just like jesus spoke the same words and the same anointing because it comes through his spirit that we have received unto ourselves. So if we hear and we receive it, those things that we need, they will begin to manifest in your life. That healing for your family, that healing in your body, that healing in your finances will begin to materialize. Matthew chapter 9. In verse 28. Now this is whenever Jesus was working a miracle. It says, And when he was come into the house, the blind man, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe you that I am able to do this. I'm talking about healing them. Do you believe that I can do this? And they said unto him, yes, Lord, we believe you can do this. That's why whenever you come up here for prayer, you're not coming up here for prayer. All right? We're not, we are asking the Lord. Yes, we are praying, but we are proclaiming healing. But I many times will ask you, do you believe? Do you believe that the Lord can do this? Now, I'm not doing this, but do you believe? That when we lay hands in obedience on you and we pray the prayer of faith, do you believe that this is going to happen? How many of you have I asked you that? How many of you have I asked you all over the... Do you believe? That's a very important question. Do you believe? Then when he touched their eyes saying, according to your... According to your faith, be it unto you. All right. My, and their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. Okay? These guys, thank goodness they weren't deaf. Because 
the reason they, whenever Jesus came there, they, they knew that he had been working miracles, but Jesus said to them, hey, fellas, do you believe that I can do this? Do you believe that whenever I lay my hands on your eyes that you're going to be healed? They said, yes, we believe. And he said, it's because of your faith. Your faith activates my power. And by your faith, anything is possible. If you believe, all things are possible to those who believe. And let's flip that scripture. That means nothing is possible for those who don't. If you don't believe, if you come up here and you're asking for healing in your body or healing in your family or relationships or whatever and you don't believe it, you're still welcome to come. But it's very crucial that you believe. What if those men had said, Jesus, we just don't believe it, but we'd like for you to try. We'll try anything. A lot of times when people come down here, they're like, man, I've been to every doctor in the world. I have spent tons of money and, and you know, and uh, I, so I'll try anything now. I'll even go to the preacher. I'll even go to God. I'll even come down and let the congregation of the Lord lay their hands on me because I got no other choice. Hey, and that's fine as long as you believe. But why not come here first? Why not go to the great physician first? The only way that Jesus can open your eyes, I want to say this, and I want you to get this. This is where I'm going. We're about to arrive. The only way that Jesus can open your eyes like he opened these men's eyes to the reality of what is possible in your life, to let that faith, that, that evidence of the things that you can't see, because if you don't have faith, you are walking blindly. We walk by faith, not by sight. I have, if you are a true believer, you walk by the things that you can't see. You don't walk by the things that you do see. Amen? And the only way that he can open your eye, your blinded eyes, is for him to speak to your ears. And he uses his disciples, he uses his servants to speak into your ears and to grow your faith. When your ears are open, you will begin to see quite clearly. And you might even be able to feed someone else through their ears what you have received by faith. Without faith, you cannot please God. Without faith, you cannot be saved. Without faith, you cannot be healed. Without faith, you cannot be blessed. And without faith, you cannot feed his sheep. Stand with me. I mean it this time. I'd like to ask the uh, musicians to please come. Jesus said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that it is by the foolishness of preaching that we are saved. That we are saved by this foolish thing that your teacher and that your preacher gets up and does every week. That that saves you. We are saved by the foolishness of preaching. How many of you want to be saved? I want to be saved. I want to be preached to. I want to be taught to. I want to have my ears attended to the Word of God at every opportunity that I possibly can because I want to be saved. You can say, I don't care about healings or blessings. I do. I've been healed on several occasions. I am, I'm not a rich man, but man, am I ever blessed. Everywhere I look, I see God's hand on my life. I see His blessings on everything that pertains to me. Do I want His blessings? Oh, yes. I want His blessings on me, on my house, on my generations. I want His favor and His hands all over everything that pertains to me. And I want to have my portion of whatever that He has prepared for me. Whatever He has taken, He's broken, He's blessed, and He's multiplied. 
I want mine. You can, you can say what? Ah, I'll be fine. I'm just going to go watch some football. Football's about to be on. I love football. I love to do a lot of things. I need to hear the word of God. We need to hear the word of God. We need to put ourselves in a place to where the anointed word of God is flowing. What he has prepared for you, let it not be wasted. Let not, let not there be one fragment of it wasted. Will all of my problems go away? They never will until you breathe your last breath. But oh, there's a provision. There's a provision in the preached word of God. By this foolish thing we call preaching, there's saving, there's blessing, there's edification for the body of Christ. If you live in a perpetual house of horrors, if you never seem to have enough, no matter how hard you work, if your family is in chaos, no matter how much you talk, There's been a table set for you. It's time to come and dine. The master calls. Come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude and turned the water into wine, he calls unto you. Children, let's come and dine. Let's come and dine. I don't want to leave not one fragment that God has prepared for me. I want it all. I want everything in my basket. I don't want to leave anything behind. Now, with every message, there should be an ask. Right? There should be an ask. If you're not asking somebody to do something, then you may as well shut up. You've wasted their time and yours. So I've got an ask for you today. Those things that you can't see yet, but you would love to have blessed in your life, whether it's a it's a husband, whether it's a financial provision, those things that you can't see yet, whether it is, whether it, whatever it is, whether it is a healing in your family, whatever it is, whether it is being infilled with the Holy Ghost, I don't want you to, I don't want you to come down here, whatever it is that you have need of, because I'll tell you, Jesus never ran out of anything. He never ran out of anything. There's nothing that he's ever run out of. He owns it all. It was all created by him and for him. I don't want you to come ask for it. No, because asking for it, I want you to, I would like for us, if you have a need in your life, this is my ask. If you have a need in your life, like for those of us who have needs in our lives, to come forward. Come to the front and don't ask Jesus for it, but thank Jesus for it. Thank Him for what He is doing. Thank Him for what He has done in your past. But not only that, He has already made provision for your need. I want you to come and thank Him for what He is going to do for you, what He is doing for you right now. Say, I can't see it yet, Lord. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know how you're going to do this. But I thank you for it anyway. I believe that you can. I believe that you will. And I want to come and thank you for meeting my need. I want to thank you for making provision for me. I want to thank you for that basket of blessing and favor over my life. If you have no needs, don't come. 
You're good. You're dismissed if you've got no needs. But for those of us who have needs in our lives, for those of us who have desires, come and dine. The master who never runs out of anything, he, he has made all provision. He's Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. He is able to provide all things that we need. Come and dine, the master called. Let's sing. Hallelujah. I'll leave you with this. Such as your faith is. If you came up here and you proclaimed what you cannot see. If you heard the word of the Lord, but you received that miracle, that provision that you cannot yet see. According to your faith, so be it unto you. So be it unto you. God bless you. Spend the remainder of this day with someone that you love. God bless you. You're dismissed.